As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. May your word be that goes from my mouth, O Lord. May it not return to you empty, but accomplish that which you purpose, and succeed in the thing for which you send it. Now open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Amen. Sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. It's the season, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas that uh, is focused on the coming of Christ. And we always begin Advent with a focus on the second coming of Christ at the end of times. We have these beautiful blue banners and pyramids that is representing the early dawn blue sky as the sun comes, right, and rises. And that reminding us of the coming of the sun. So the focus in Advent is the coming of the sun, of Jesus, the Messiah. And starting with the focus on the second coming. Now if you also notice your beautiful bulletin covers, uh, we have during the season of Advent, each week there will be a different theme, and this week's theme is hope. So we've departed from the normal lectionary scripture passages that are assigned for this Sunday, and we've chosen scripture that is on this theme of hope and the second coming of Christ, and the end times, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's what we're focusing on. We have scripture chosen from Psalm 33, which is... Uh, about the sovereignty of God and our hope in God, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what we may be experiencing, trials and tribulations, sufferings, persecutions at the hands of our enemy, whatever it may be, we nevertheless, we put our hope in God even at times when it seems like God may be against us. We put our hope in this promise that God is ultimately for us and rest in His promises, His mercy and grace that endure forever. We put our hope in God. In Romans chapter 4, Paul writes about Abraham's faith. Abraham's hope, hoping even against hope. See, Abraham was promised two things. That he would have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand in the seashore. And that he would be given the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, etc. Right? And yet at the end of his life, Abraham had one son. He had two, but one he had kind of written off and didn't have a relationship with anymore. He had one son of the promise, Isaac. A son that, uh, you know, was a miracle that he was even born in the first place. And then he tried to kill along the way. But never mind that. He had one son and no grandchildren, no descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand in the seashore. Just one son. And the only piece of property that he owned in that promised land was a six by six by six feet deep burial plot. That was it. The land flowing with milk and honey, huh? Even though his eye could not see it, or that his life had not yet experienced, he put his hope in this promise that God would make good on his word whether he got to see it or not. He put his hope, even hoping against hope, in that promise. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus encourages his disciples to constantly be coming. To be coming even when it doesn't seem that God is granting the justice or fulfilling his promises or blessing. To keep coming, continually come, like this woman in the parable. But it's the last sentence in that story is the reason I chose this gospel. At the end of it, Jesus asked that haunting question. When the Son of Man comes... Before we even go on, I don't know what he's talking about there. Is he talking about when he comes as a baby born in Bethlehem? Is he talking about when he comes to the River Jordan and begins his three years of ministry? Is he talking about when he's risen from the dead and comes back to find his disciples? Is he talking about the end times when he comes again? I don't know. But the haunting question is, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? It's a question I've been asking a lot lately. When the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on earth? I'm sure He'll find it somewhere on earth, but the question I have, is, will He find it here, in this place, among us? Will He find it in my children, in my, great, in my grandchildren, or my great-grandchildren? I know it's a question that is not just on my heart, but is shared by many a parent and grandparent sitting in this room. 
John, through, through John, verse 4, it's only one chapter, Third John, verse 4, John writes, I have no greater joy than this, that my children are walking in the faith. And we can all say, yeah, that would bring me no greater joy than that, to have my children walking in the faith. But will they be? There is powers and principalities at work in today's world that are drawing our children and us away from faith, away from a commitment to Christ or a relationship with the living Lord. We live in a day and a time when not only is church attendance down across the board, but actually the surveys that are filled out, there are more people marking none than at any other time, and it's not just in the Pacific Northwest. You know what I mean by marking none? When they do the religious surveys, are you, do you claim to be a Christian or Jew or Buddhist or Muslim or whatever it may be? At the end, the bottom one is none. And this used to be known as the none zone, right? And the more people in the Pacific Northwest would mark none than anywhere else in the United States except a couple of years ago. We lost out to Connecticut. <laughs> Nothing to brag about. It's still really low here. But more people mark none in Connecticut now than anywhere else. More than Oregon or Washington. It's sweeping across the country. Those who have grown up in the faith now claim to be religious, but not necessarily a believer in God. And the great bumper sticker of coexist is the common theme, right? Picking a little bit from this religion and that religion and, and be religious, but not necessarily a believer. That, that we want to be good people and what religions promote, world peace, taking care of creation, being a good person. But not necessarily a believer in God. And Jesus, great teacher and example to live by, but not necessarily believing that he's the Son of God, that he was risen from the dead, and that he will return. But to be religious. There's many a book written about this lately. There's one author that, uh, that wrote a book. His name is John Westerhoff. And he wrote the book entitled, Will Our Children Have Faith? And then in the book, he kind of twists the question around and asks, will our faith have children? And the point in his book is, what are we doing as parents to instill the faith in our children, to carry it on? Do our children grow up not just learning about Jesus or about God and doctrine, but do they grow up with a relationship with Christ? Do they sense in us as parents a passion and devotion do they see us in prayer? Do they see us in church? Or if there's a ball game on, would we rather be there? Do we prioritize hunting and fishing or golf or sports or whatever it may be rather than worshiping the Lord? Do we involve ourselves and our children in a community of faith where we bear one another's burdens and involve ourselves in the mission and ministry of Christ. I was watching the football games yesterday <laughs> after saying all of that. I was watching, there's some great games on, right? And, uh, and, I, and I was noticing these commercials, yeah, I'm sure you've seen them, where they've got the parents and the little kids all dressed up in the same jerseys. You've seen that? And they're, they're high-fiving their kids when some, their team scores and they're talking about the game and telling their kids about this player and that. And the kids are growing up to be fans, right? They're being discipled in the team to become followers of that team. You seen these commercials? You know what I'm talking about? Right? We don't, we don't use that kind of language when we talk about that, but that's what we're doing is we're discipling them to become followers of our team. And those kids grow up. They've got the jersey on. They know all the players. They know who's being drafted the next year. You know, I mean, they, they grow up as followers and disciples of the team. And they carry on the family tradition. And they want to become a husky or a cougar or an eagle or whatever it may be. Do our kids grow up seeing that kind of passion and excitement and devotion to Christ? 
Or do they grow up saying, well, you know, it wasn't that important to my parents. Why should it be that important to me? Now, saying all of that, I also want you to know there's no guarantee that if you do all these things, go to church on Sundays, tithe, read the Bible and pray with your kids, give up chocolate for Lent or whatever other, you know, disciple or discipline you might have, spiritual discipline. There's no guarantee that your kid is going to be devoted and a follower. And many can attest to that. Pastor, I did all those things and still yet my kids, they're not interested. Because see, the reality is we are working against powers and principalities at work in our culture that are far greater than whatever we face growing up where it is not cultural or necessarily cool to continue in the faith. That was a kid thing or a grandparent thing, but, you know, we, we're evolved from that. We think for ourselves. The other reality is that God also must do something. God's got to break in. It's not just about our preparations and what we do for our kids or for ourselves, for the faith. God's got to do something. This question that Jesus asks, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Ultimately, I think that is a question of hope, of faith, of Jesus' hope and Jesus' faith. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? As far as the naked eye could see, Jesus would have to answer, no. From the moment he was born, and came into this world. He experienced nothing but rejection. There was no place for him in the inn. Herod was out to kill him. Nobody believed that his mom was a virgin. And it was that way all the way through the rest of his life. When he came and he started to do ministry from that moment in the Jordan to when he was hung on the tree at the end of his ministry. Hanging there, looking down, did he find faith on earth? There was no one left. Even Peter who had vowed that if everyone, everyone else would forsake you, I will not, I'll stay with you to the end, had denied him three times and was no longer around. Judas had betrayed him with a kiss. James and John and all the others had fled. There was no one left. He even wondered if God had forsaken him. When he rose from the dead, would he find faith on earth? He went to find his disciples, and where did he find them? But cowarding in an upper room in fear, not in faith. When he comes at the end of time, will he find faith on earth? And as far as we can see, it seems less and less likely. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And yet, nevertheless, despite all that the eye can see or what he experiences, Jesus would nevertheless answer the question, yes. Because that is his hope, that is his faith, because that is what God has promised. That I will send the Spirit, the Word out, and it will not return empty. And he's banking on that. It will not return empty, but death will be swallowed up in victory. Sins will be forgiven, sinners will be freed, and followers will gather. Where there were two or three or two or three hundred where there will be two or three hundred thousand or two or three hundred million gatherers will gather and they will be filled with the joy of salvation and go from here sharing the good news of Jesus Christ so that others may come to hear and believe and hearts receive. Thy kingdom come is not just a prayer, it is a proclamation. God's kingdom will come and it will come even among us. Whether we can see it now, whether our, our hearts or ears can perceive or our eyes can see, God's kingdom will come and it will come among us. And Advent is not just about our preparation. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare our children's hearts. Even more than preparation, it is a proclamation. It is a declaration. It is an announcement from God's messengers. Behold, the King comes. The Christ, He will be born in you. Yes, even you who grew up in the faith and have no time for it anymore. He's making time for you. He's coming for you. Your doubt 
cannot dissuade his determination. Your sins will not surmount his forgiveness and mercy. Your apathy will pale in comparison to his passion. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And his answer is yes. For that is his hope, that is his faith, that is his conviction, for that is God's promise. And his word will come true. He will bank his life on it. He will go to the cross and die for it. For you and for your salvation. Amen. Amen.